I got drafted when I was, um, when I was uh, a young man uh, into the Korean War. And when I went down for my uh, interview, I had just finished reading the book In His Steps, from whence comes the phrase, what would Jesus do? That book impressed me. Everybody's wearing this WWJD, what would Jesus do? So when I was having my interview, uh, I said, I, I have to do what Jesus would do, and I'm not sure that Jesus would run a bayonet into somebody and cut out his guts. The commanding officer said, you're making it sound ugly. He then smiled and he said, I know, I know the ludicrous nature of my statement. It is ugly, of course, but you must realize that most of the people in the military never do anything that ugly. Could you fly an airplane and drop a bomb? I said, I'd have my hand on the throttle and I'd be ready to drop the bomb. But where I am right now, I would have to ask Jesus, if you were in my place, would you drop this bomb? And the colonel yelled back at me, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard. Everybody knows that Jesus would never drop a bomb. Now it scares me that we have a generation of Christians who know what Jesus would do and yet will do the opposite and call themselves followers of Jesus. Is it ever acceptable for a Christian to, to kill? One of my friends, who is a pacifist, said he cannot ever imagine Jesus running a sword through the chest of another human being. I have to take this argument seriously. At the same time, we are mandated to love the neighbor. And among um, the things we have to do in the course of loving the neighbor is we have to defend the defenseless or the vulnerable are those who are deemed to be highly at risk. The problem with violence for the, in, in, in so many ways is that once you concede violence, it becomes the only and best option. Too, too often we end up not going down roads, not preparing ourselves for, for things that we could do that are intermediate steps between passivity and, and violent action. In North America today, I think there's a huge variety of opinion among Christians about participation in war or the nature of war. There's lots of Christians, unfortunately today, who see it as, see the situation we're in now as not unlike the Crusades of the 1100s, uh, where Christian culture and Christian nations are under attack uh, by unchristian people, in this case, as in the Crusades, by, by what they see as radical Muslims. Uh, they think that war is not only justifiable, but necessary and a good thing, perhaps. One of the negative consequences of Christians blindly supporting national war is that it makes it too easy for the world to view Christianity as this institutional and political uh, organization or entity that has, has been in bed with the state, you know, the church and the state, co-mingling for so many centuries and it's easy for people to write off Christianity as just this power-hungry institution that finds theological reasons why nations can go to war and this is everything that Jesus stood opposed to. There are some time when peacekeeping does require people who are willing to take lives to be killed but I also understand that there can be a much greater good in those situations. How would Jesus handle it? I don't know. There is an argument, and a good argument, that we should not be killing each other. But I'm never comfortable with a situation where we are going to allow and to watch others kill those that cannot defend themselves. I have been in 20 countries uh, just in the last uh, eight months. Uh, I've been traveling a lot. And everywhere I go, this question is uh, this question of the relationship between Christian faith and Christian religions, denominations and churches, their, their relation to violence is on everybody's mind. 
and we're all afraid that religion is being used to intensify distrust and uh, division and uh, hatred and fear and violence. I hear this everywhere I go. They say, how can Christians in the United States support your foreign policy, which seems to be a policy of domination, aggression, preemptive war, and all the rest? And when they ask me this, I tell them, look, a lot of Christians in the United States do support that foreign policy that, that believes in redemptive violence and believes in empire as a way of, uh, of bringing peace. I, I say, but a lot of us don't. Unfortunately, throughout church history and throughout history in, in the world, uh, Christians have not hesitated in times of war when they felt their political gains outweighed their theology, I guess, to kill each other in the Lord's name. I would also be hesitant to say that Jesus was a pacifist. We can look at his lives and the actions and the things that he does and we see tendencies towards that, but we also see confrontation. Confrontation is not militaristic necessarily, but one can look at the life of Christ and see examples where he is not pacifist in the definition of true pacifism. I think a, a major theological problem in the church in North America is in fact this, this, this embracing of, of, a, of a crusade model. And certainly in the last five years, uh, the crusade is getting much more press. We ha hear people actually arguing for crusade approach to evil in the world. Um, that's even more disturbing than, than the just war. The core of this is, I, I think Jesus is left out of it completely. I think we have marginalized Jesus from the church. I think we have, we've got 1,500 years of theological reflection. We're very good at it, but we have in fact silenced Jesus. Make sure I've got some level. I'm warm. Done. Okay, so whenever, uh, whenever you want to start. All right, let's go. Well, welcome everyone to the Meeting House Roundtable. Uh, this is Bruxy. This is our behind-the-scenes leadership podcast for the Meeting House family of churches. And thank you for tuning in, especially those of you who are elders and leaders here at the Meeting House. Um, I think you're going to get something important out of today's podcast as we're talking about the peace position, which is really fundamental to our DNA here. And uh, we're also going to be raising the question, why has it been so difficult for Christians to follow what seems to be the plain teaching of Jesus on this one topic throughout our history. So this should be a good overview of that topic. And we have a special guest with us. First, before we get there, just so you know who's sitting around the table, we've got Daryl, our a community development pastor. Hello. And uh, beside Daryl's also Tim, our senior pastor. Hey, it's great to be here. Well said, both of you. Thank We're you. off to a great start. And, and it's then good to be articulate, isn't it? Yeah, right. here we are. <laughs> and then we've also got a special guest. We've got John Campia. And uh, John is someone who is currently in the process of making a documentary on the peace position mm -hmm. and where the church sits in contemporary society and, and a historical overview. And so we want to also be talking to him about the peace position and, and what he's learning in making the documentary. So, John, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with you, John. Tell us, you're, you're, why, why this documentary? Uh, what's it called? Why did you get started doing this? You're not a filmmaker by trade. This is a new endeavor for you. What's your motivation? The concept of Christians' involvement in violence has always been of interest to me. Mm. And I've always kind of had a what I call a moderate pacifist position that I, you know, I, well, personally, I'm a pacifist, but, you know, not so much die hard. So I decided, you know what, it's interesting. Let's do a documentary. I'm going to travel across the country. I met with 22 different history professors, theologians, uh, seminary profs, political leaders, what have you, and asking them the questions about just war theory and pacifism, Christian pacifism. I was three interviews into uh, the documentary, all of which were done with uh, Just War Theorists supporters, which changed the documentary fun fundamentally from, let's just see how this is, because I'm a moderate pacifist. It's strange, because talking to three Just War Theorists turned me into a hardcore pacifist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, therein <laughs> lied the beginning. 
quick overview of the history of the church as, as it's grown. You have the early church for the first 300 years with one voice agree that Christians should not be involved in any enterprise of violence. It seems to be assumed in the, in the years before Constantine, for example, especially with regard to war and violence, uh, that Christians were not normally supposed to take part in the military. Uh, actually, military service is sometimes condemned and certainly not to participate in other forms of violence. Roman rule at least protected the Israelite people from something far worse. They could have been uh, plundered at the hands of people far more cruel. They received far worse treatment in Egypt where they were slaves, worse treatment in uh, Babylon and so on. And Roman rule at least maintained something of uh, justice. I think, it's, I think it's a true statement to say Christians were pacifists in the first three centuries of the Christian era. Um, but of course the reason why they were pacifists is that they were politically and socially marginalized. Um, I don't think they had an option. <laughs> Any revolt by the Christians at the time would have been quelled, it would have been pointless. Uh, hmm. That's why they were pacifists. Huh. How, however, suggesting that there are two big weaknesses in that argument. Number one is the writings of the church fathers, yeah. where right. they specifically say over and over again, no, this is what Jesus taught, therefore yeah. we're not going to raise a sword. Mm -hmm. We will willingly die. We love this stuff. This is mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. The other thing that it ignores is the political temperature of the time in Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Good. Jesus came on the scene, people were looking for a fight. Mm -hmm. right. they, yeah. they didn't care. And in, in Old Testament understanding, being outnumbered, I mean, the Jews thought they were the Spartans. It doesn't matter if they were outnumbered. They right. thought with God on their side, they can do anything and yeah. achieve the great victory. Yeah. It wasn't because they thought they'd get beat that they were pacifists. Israel was a conquered and battered nation at the time. It, it would have been as though Hitler had won the Second World War and had invaded a number of nations and they were defeated. And he was an obvious enemy and an aggressor and, and not treating people nicely. Nero, who is known as one of the great Christian persecutors, um, we have accounts of his persecution of Christians and his persecution of Christians being so brutal that uh, many in the Roman populace actually felt sympathy for the Christians because Nero was just crazy. He was a madman. We're told, for example, that he impaled Christians and would put the poles that they were impaled on uh, into his garden and at night he would light the Christians on fire so that he could walk uh, at nighttime to illumination. This way of peace, that the teaching of Jesus led to a life of peace, was unquestioned until a guy came along named Constantine. Clearly, uh, when Constantine became emperor and professed Christian faith in the fourth century, something changed with regard to the, the church's relationship to the empire as a whole, and a part of that, the, the church's attitude toward war. In order to be a member of the armed forces in the Roman Empire or a member of the civil service, you had to submit to uh, Roman religion. You had to acknowledge the Roman deities. Since uh, no Christian would say, Caesar Curious, Caesar is Lord, we said, Jesus Curious, Jesus is Lord. Since no, no uh, Christian would defer to the idolatry of the state, Christians forbidden, were forbidden service in the armed forces and the civil service. With the conversion of uh, Constantine, however, the situation changed overnight. All of a sudden now, one had to be baptized, that is a Christian, in order to serve. In fact, some church historians say there are only two periods of church history. The period before Constantine and then the 1700 years after Constantine. So, indicating just how significant his conversion is. For many Christians, Constantine was seen as practically vice Jesus, Jesus second in command. I mean, the, the, the way a, a church historian Eusebius, who lived at the time, who knew Constantine, Constantine talks about it, uh, Constantine was a, a, almost a semi-divine being. I mean, it is an amazing plot twist when the Roman emperor, the guy, the guy who represents the, 
the country that has invaded Israel and has, was responsible for the death of Christ and, and has killed thousands of Christians for centuries in the Roman Colosseum, that the, the emperor of that nation of Rome himself becomes a Christian. That's fascinating. The church has never been able to hold on to power very well at all. It has corrupted very, very soon. And we see the, we see the idea of, uh, after Constantine, the state church. You know, you don't have to look all the way back, all the way through church history, although you can, but the idea that the closer the church has been to the state, the closer theology has changed to emphasize state priorities. But what happens now when the emperor of Rome says, yeah, Christianity is the way to go? And what happens when that is a peace-loving, a pacifist morality? What happens to your armies if the entire nation starts converting to Christianity? What happens to Rome? as a power in the world, if people actually buy into the peace teachings of Jesus, they're not going to be a military strength. So Constantine, he needs help. He wants people to buy into Christianity as a unifying philosophy, but he can't have people buy into the peace teaching uh, or Rome itself will become weak. And so there are some theologians that are willing to help him find ways of doing an end run around this central core teaching of Jesus. Augustine is a theologian of the empire. I mean, Augustine's, Augustine is trying to help the church wrestle with how to be faithful to this God of love and rule the world. Augustine basically said what are still standard parts of just war theory. Uh, only those who are le legitimately in charge can declare a, a war a war can only be declared if there's a just cause, if, if you've suffered real harm at someone else's hands. It has to be, in some sense, uh, a winnable war. Uh, and finally, it has to be fought fairly, fought within just bounds. But Augustine didn't develop those all that clearly. Uh, but it's a general rule of thumb. Um, again, wars are basically defensive, basically trying to protect yourself in one way or another as a society as opposed to just an individual. When we start with Christianity, Christianity is a, a persecuted minority. And by the time you get to Augustine, Christianity is a persecuting majority. And he did two things. Number one, he began to develop what will become known as the just war tradition, saying that citizens have the right to, to defend themselves when they are unjustly attacked. Augustine also began to argue that it was appropriate for the state at the behest of the church to use force to try to correct Christians who had wrong ideas. And in doing so, Augustine, though he did many good things, lays the foundation for what will become the inquisition and persecution of Christians by Christians throughout a long history of medieval Europe. The arguments for um, Christian just war, of course, have been articulated in no little detail. The problem with any just war theory is no nation has ever undertaken a war it thought to be unjust. Just war theory is not an endorsement of all war. In fact, it's supposed to be a limitation of Christian involvement in and when involved in limiting what Christians can do and what the state can do in, in warfare. It's, it's not supposed to be an endorsement of all conflicts. It's actually supposed to be a tempering um, series of criteria to, to limit the carnage and horror of war. Anyone thoughtful in the just war position will readily admit that war is a horror and a nightmare, but, but it's an inevitable reality and it must be tempered. The theory runs something like this. As long as in your individual life you're being a good Christian, then when you play a role of a soldier, when you put on a hat uh, that says, now I'm in, in this particular role, then you're allowed to act more like a soldier than like a person who's living out the teachings of Jesus. 
Because certainly, someone who's living out the teachings of Jesus is loving their enemy, laying their life down for their enemy, not killing their enemy. What they're able to teach then is that, because it raises the question, well, what happens to the command to love your enemy? Uh, do I just not have to love my enemy anymore if, as long as I'm a soldier? And what Augustine is able to teach is, no, no, God only cares about, or mostly cares about your heart. Augustine is able to encourage the belief that your heart is what matters, not so much your actions. So as long as you're loving your enemy in your heart, it's okay if you're killing them. I think if we look at it more philosophically, Jesus also commands us to stand up for the rights of the oppressed, to protect the widow, to protect the orphan, to protect those who are downtrodden. And he uh, physically does that. He endorses it. Not only does he endorse it, he exemplifies that. Sometimes I believe that in order to do that, that requires confrontation. I would always hope and strive to bring about that confrontation through peaceful means and to bring about that dialogue through uh, non-militaristic means. Uh, I'm not somebody that loves war, but I believe sometimes the oppressor is unwilling to listen to reason. Sometimes the oppressor has an agenda and they won't be uh, philosophically moved. They won't be peacefully dissuaded from that position. At that time, I think that I have a mandate as an individual to thoughtfully stand up for those who are being oppressed, for those who are being, uh, being used, and for those who are being abused. I think there are those times when a country and a people's right to exist is threatened. And I think that, uh, that the just war would sit there and say, you know what, this is justifiable. That being said, I think it is, I have a very, very high threshold for agreeing that any war is just. Um, I think the cost is so high that to justify us going to war against another country is so tremendously, because of the impact it has for us on a nation and also on individuals. Um, to rewire an entire generation of people, to make them go through the both horror of war of losing of losing lives, um, but also the horror of taking lives, which in some ways I think is just as traumatic. The other thing they love to do is dig out theologians, talk about a just war theory. That's exactly what it is. And all these people who, are, who argue with me, quote Calvin, uh, quote Luther, quote, quote uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and that's great. I say, let's put them up against Jesus. That's what they say, just war. Jesus says, love your enemies. Given the age in which we live, war is total destruction of nations. The just war theory, when applied to any modern war, will not work. Certainly it hasn't worked in Iraq. Did we assure that civilians would not be hurt? And have we in fact spared civilians? Let me say this, we've lost now uh, more than 2,500 people over there, men and women, bravely def standing up for what they believe was the right thing. And I have great respect for those people who are laying down their lives over there. But having said that, there are tens of thousands, maybe as many as 100,000 Iraqis who have died. I mean, the soldiers have not been the major casualties in this war. It's been the civilians. None of the criteria that gives just war theory its validity were operative in Iraq nor do I believe they can be operative in a modern world. I think the United States is doing its very best to keep civilian casualties at a minimum. But even then, the number of civilian casualties is overwhelming. I just don't see how you can play theological games on the one hand and believe in Jesus on the other. I think there are situations where People, particularly the defenseless and the vulnerable, are at such risk that it is a serious failure in love of the neighbor not to defend and protect those people.
Orwell said concerning the pacifist movement in England that pacifism is always possible in countries that are small islands maintained by a huge navy. Very often pacifism is rejected because it said it, it won't work. Um, I think that's a misunderstanding of pacifism. Pacifism isn't a strategy to bring about a more peaceful world. Just war theory and uh, the, or the crusade is, is a strategy to bring about a peaceful world. Okay, for me, being a Christian means accepting Jesus as both Savior and Lord. And so if Jesus teaches, love your enemies, that means I love my enemies. And if I am to love my enemies, that means I cannot go out and try killing my enemies. His words in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, uh, obviously uh, state this in perhaps the most striking way, you know, where he talks about not paying back evil for evil, about turning the other cheek and going the second mile and, and uh, not refusing to give to anyone who asks. When he talks about uh, not only does he say don't hate your enemies, but he says love your enemies in tangible ways, and uh, which is an imitation of the way God in heaven treats those who are the unrighteous, those who are his enemies. You cannot read through the Sermon on the Mount without coming away with the sense that to be a Christian is to be a pacifist. Mahatma Gandhi once said very carefully and very forthrightly, everybody knows what Jesus was trying to say, except for Christians. Sometimes when we talk about this topic, Christians who have grown up in the church for a long time can be very threatened. One of the reasons is that it's not talked about very much in the church. I think that raises a question is, how can someone grow up in a, in a church that claims to teach the Bible and follow the teachings of Jesus and to listen all their lives to what pastors and preachers and priests are saying and I'll often talk to these people and they'll hear me, hear me speak on this topic and it is as though they're hearing this perspective for the first time. And, and so they'll go through sometimes some anger, sometimes some confusion, like having a sense of being ripped off. Like, how, what, what? I, I've been listening to this my whole life and I never, heard, I, I never heard someone point out that Jesus actually meant this. or that. And so I think it raises another issue of what's going on with the Christian religion in Western culture today? I think we in our culture are not used to suffering. I mean, you look at basically everything that we do in our culture, it is to, to avoid inconvenience, avoid suffering. But Jesus not only suffered, but he also talked about his followers suffering as if to follow his program meant suffering. Now for people who are conditioned to avoid suffering, then it's, it's natural that they would try to find some way of eliminating this claim of Jesus. I'm not sure that, in fact I'm sure, I am sure that your left-handed accusation that the church is silent or near silent on such issues isn't true, at least in the churches I've ministered to. I don't think the church engages the question of whether or not it's okay to kill someone, in part because the church has had 1,500 years of ruling the world. We know that if we address the question head on and we, and we come to a position that was that was the consensus of the early church uh, that bloodshed 
killing other people was wrong, it would radically affect our ability to rule the world. There's a part of me that very much wants to be a Christian pacifist. Uh, when, I, when I read the teaching of Jesus, see the model of Jesus, but there are other factors that have to, to be taken into consideration. I think the most compelling argument for a Christian just war position has to do with the sense of responsibility that Christians have to see that justice is done in the world. And justice in this sense is to make sure that the innocent are protected and that violence is held to a minimum. Um, there's a, a, a strong need to restrain the evil and violence in the world and the Christian just war position is, uh, is the church's response recognizing that there's a presumption against violence, that violence is, is not a good thing but that in some cases it is necessary in order to, uh, to have a more peaceful world. The difficulty of the Old Testament in terms of uh, posing a problem for Christians who hold a non-violent position uh, is, is huge. War in the Old Testament is more a problem than a solution. Uh, as some have pointed out, it proves both too little and too much. The, it's clearly a problem for Christian pacifists because if, if you believe that it is the same God speaking through the prophets in the Old Testament, who is also speaking through Christ uh, and the apostles in the New Testament, then it's very difficult to, to correlate uh, an absolute rejection of all warfare with what is commanded according to, to the Old Testament scripture. So obviously it's a problem for pacifists. But it's also a problem for those of us who end up on the just war side of this debate because the way in which warfare is carried out in the Old Testament is in no way the, the way in which we would defend warfare today. I think it's important when we're talking about the, the difference between the Old and the New Testament that we remember that everything written in the New Testament assumes the Old Testament. It isn't a matter of, of one or the other. A lot of people look at the Bible and say this is a guidebook for my life and they get caught in the confusion of it and, and I think first of all it's a proper understanding of what scripture is. The Bible is not a handbook of life as opposed to a narrative of how God's interaction with his people. The Bible is a narrative. It tells the story, a developmental story, of God's people going through a number of different stages and making an awful lot of mistakes. So you can't just grab any portion of the Bible and say, well, look, it's in the Bible, therefore we need to do it. One of the amazing ways this comes up regularly that fascinates me is uh, when Christians who advocate just war say, well, war is in the Bible. Yes, it's in the Bible. It's not what Jesus supported. It's, it isn't defensive war in many cases. Uh, certainly not in the case of God commanding Israel to go in and exterminate the Canaanites. Uh, it's very much offensive war. It's not defensive war against aggression. In some places you have God commanding that the, the whole population of a given area be wiped out. And, and so it, it's, there's nothing like uh, immunity for non-combatants in the warfare. Whenever I bring up this subject with theologians, they do two things with me. First of all, they start quoting the Old Testament. And they say, look at all the wars in the Old Testament. See, God sanctified wars and glorified wars and all of this. Yes, he did. Please note that when you come to the New Testament, Jesus said, as of old, you have heard, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I give you a new commandment. I don't want to be nasty, but if Jesus says it's a new commandment, I think he means it's a new commandment, which means it supersedes the old one. The old commandment was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus says we're going to go beyond the Hebraic expectation of righteousness. There is a higher standard for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. He makes that clear in the Sermon on the Mount. I just wrote down a couple of quick passages here. Yeah, good. Coming from Hebrews, Galatians, Romans, and some of the Gospels, Hebrews 10.9 says, He who took away the first covenant established the second. 
Hebrews 8.13 says, And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. Hmm. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us, not from the wonderful Old Testament, Christ has redeemed us from the curse mm. of the law. Mm. Romans 7, 4 through 6 says, Therefore, you also have become dead to the law through Christ. Now that we have been delivered from the law, like once again, referencing the Old Testament is almost something bad, something yes. that didn't work, like Tim mm. is saying here. Mm. Having died to what we were held by, mm. uh, John 1, 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And Brux, you were pointing out about John, Luke 16, 16 says, The law and the prophets reigned until mm. John. Yeah. The fundamental exhortation at the beginning of Romans 13 is to the church, to Christians, to submit to the authority of the state. I mean, th this is the fundamental point. I think the scriptures teach us that the government and the authorities are, in a sense, our authorities, and they, they come from God. They are, they are, in a sense, uh, they are ordained by God. The Roman Republic was a, a military republic, so if you obey what Paul says, then you're advocating a military republic. I don't know whether these people read the same Bible I do, because uh, it seems to me that when Paul and Peter are ordered to cease their preaching, their response is very simple. We have to obey God rather than man. One of the very interesting questions I would ask of those who always quote Romans 13 is a very simple question. Where was Paul when he wrote that? He was in jail. A lot of people refer to Romans 13 as the passage that advocates Christians aligning themselves with the government in war. What Romans 13 does is ask a Christian to submit to government, but not to join government in war. In fact, what people often do is they refer to Romans 13 out of context. I would encourage anyone to open up their Bibles, find Romans 13, and then just back up a few verses, because the, the chapter divisions are artificial. They were added in later. Back up a few verses. Paul is in the middle of a context of how a Christian should never be violent. That's the, con the context that Romans 13 arrives in. in. At the end of Romans 12, Paul is teaching how, he's reminding them of Jesus' peace teaching. When the authorities in fact say you have to curtail what you are doing in so far as witnessing for Christ, they say, sorry state, we march to the beat of a distant drummer. Our allegiance does not ultimately belong to Caesar. It belongs to God. It's perfectly clear when you read the New Testament as a whole that that is not a kind of absolute, that is not an absolute command that has no exceptions. It's probably what we would call a, a, a virtual absolute, a, a prima facie absolute, all other things being equal, unless there's some, uh, some compelling reason that forbids it, bow to, defer to the authority of the state. I, I can read some, some specific words. When someone persecutes you, your response should be to bless them. Bless them back. Um, <clears throat> never pay back evil with evil to someone who aggresses against you. Um, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Now, there will be people who will not be peaceful towards you, but as far as it depends on you, be peaceful with everyone. Never take revenge against someone who, uh, who is uh, you know, aggressive towards you. Um, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. So I, I would say if, a, um, if an individual believer uh, honestly believes that conditions that make a war just as a use of state authority don't exist, that a, that a given war that, um, that their country is fighting is, is unjust and immoral, then that Christian will have to refuse to participate in, in that war and, and accept whatever consequences come from that. Truth is, when religion submits to politics, religion really becomes the state's whore. Religion thinks of theologies to justify what the state says need to happen. The state says we must go to war. Now if you're a Christian state, the church's role is to think of how theology can support what the state says needs to happen.
we've got to stand up and take back the land. It's a great line. Is it true? Because word on the street, rightly or wrongly, word on the street is not that Christianity is at an all-time high in its popularity rating, but an all-time low. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of people who are critical of Christianity are critical of American policy, and specifically George Bush. Again, I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong, but that just happens to be the fact. It's really relevant today because we have somebody who professes to be a Christian in the highest seat of power in the world, yeah. in the White House. We hear George W. Bush talking about how, how God has told him to go to war. Mm -hmm. And that has raised a lot of questions with people. The New York Times ran an article uh, just two years ago stating that 87% of white evangelicals in North America supported the decision to go to war. Now, not 87% of Americans, but 87% of the Christian church mm. supported the idea of going to war. Fascinating. Yeah, towards the end of his life, Jesus goes to the temple in Jerusalem, and if he is truly a military messiah, the way people are hoping, you would think he would have a, a pep rally for the cause and gather everyone together at the temple and say, okay, all of you religiously zealous people, let's organize ourselves to kick out the Romans. And instead, he goes into Jerusalem and he has a complete uh, temple tantrum. And he expresses his anger, not against the Romans, he expresses his anger against the religious hypocrites and the hypocrisy that's going on there in the temple, turning their faith into an, a system, an institution that has forgotten about the prayer, the, com the c communion with God that he calls them to. It was certainly um, the act of a, of a, of a, um, of a rabbi who was, who was um, concerned about the propriety of, of temple behavior. I, I don't see Jesus' actions as being um, uh, an act of physical aggression as much as I see it as being um, an act of uh, assertion of spiritual authority. He turns over the tables, he drives out all the animals, he effectively shuts down their religious system, maybe for a few hours, a few days, I don't know how long does it take to round up all the animals again, but these are the animals used for sacrifice and he fashions a whip and he drives out all the animals. He makes it impossible for them to just blindly carry on with their religious system without stopping and thinking about what he's saying. What Jesus is doing there is he's hitting at a core kind of injustice of the power of religion and money and how that power creates so much evil in the world and he lets people know that that's something you should be furious about. I don't see any contradiction between that and a concern for peacemaking. I see that as exactly the kind of passion we should have about, uh, about peacemaking. It's an act of great anger. Some people, and this is when you can see they're grasping at straws, are trying to say, but his rebuke of the religious system was so angry. Can't we use that as justification to, I don't know, go to war with another nation? And it's a complete disconnect. It is in keeping with his regular uh, raging rebuke against religious hypocrisy. Yes, not calling people to do physical violence against people of other faiths or of other nations. There's no connection there. With respect to our Lord's approach to the Roman centurion, why don't we start with uh, John the Baptist's approach? John the Baptist, um, among other things, said that uh, those people who were truly penitent and who were being baptized, not because they were trying to buy fire insurance, but because they were genuinely, genuine and sincere in their repentance, 
He says, among other things, that they shouldn't defraud, they shouldn't steal, and the soldier shouldn't intimidate civilians or exploit them. But nowhere does John the Baptist suggest that the soldier is wrong as such. I, th I think that, uh, the, that um, the relevancy of Jesus' treatment of the centurion, um, that he pointed to the heart of the matter. This man was a man of faith. And the fact that he is a Roman soldier was secondary, but I think it's important because that is a, would have been a great example of Jesus to have taught a personal ethic of nonviolence. But here Jesus is himself not criticizing um, the fact that this man makes his living in the military. In so many issues, for example, this issue of Jesus and the Roman centurion, uh, and Jesus dealing with centurions, and all through the, the scriptures, uh, dealing with people who work in the military. When people take this absolutist stance, it's either war is fine and okay and biblically justified and we should expect it and uh, celebrate it and see it as a valid institution of society. I mean, that's what some people seem to say. Over to the other extreme where people say, uh, if you're, uh, you know, uh, you can't be a policeman uh, uh, or be a Christian. You can't work in the military and be a cr Christian. You can't work for a subcontractor who works for the military and be a Christian. I just, I don't have time for either of those uh, Extreme, either of those extremes. I think Jesus works with people wherever they are. The, the Roman soldier is plainly a Gentile, and the centurion has a, a domestic need which our Lord addresses and lends healing. And our Lord at no point says to the man, I just think that you're doing the wrong thing every day by being a soldier at all. Well, Jesus didn't tell him to stop being a soldier. <laughs> to which I would often try. He also didn't tell him it was a bad idea to own a slave. That's true. <laughs> and as you read through history, that yeah. was actually one of the church's prime, that really? scripture was one of the prime supporting texts for you know, saying that slavery is okay. And at the same time, mm. when you tie that into the teaching of Jesus, isn't that just an example of Jesus loving his enemy? That's it. And loving yeah. your enemy doesn't mean you're going to agree with your enemy. Mm -hmm. You can't That's say, right. but wait, Jesus did nice things for Romans, so he must approve. No, Jesus mm. taught we should love our enemies. And to take a quote of a mission, mm. because Jesus didn't bring this up, this proves that it's okay to kill people, mm. I think is intellectually dishonest. Yeah. And yeah, that's probably yeah. the harshest thing I'll say. But if yeah. I, w I would agree wholeheartedly that evil has to be confronted. The issue isn't whether or not you confront evil. Just war theory has a strong presumption against violence. The whole system is set up that violence is wrong. The assumption is, is that violence is wrong in all cases unless it meets this very strict criteria. And if it doesn't meet all of this criteria, even if it meets you know, five out of six or, or six out of seven, if it, meets, you know, uh, if it meets the vast majority, that's not good enough. If a just war theorist wants to say to me that no, Christians are called to violence in the face of extreme evil when all other options have failed. And to which I reply, well, in that scenario, then you're advocating taking a sniper rifle down to an abortion clinic right. and mm -hmm. shooting abortion doctors. Yeah. There is right. no greater That's evil. Right. Right. We have tried everything else. We've tried the courts. We've tried protests. Therefore, it's okay to go and shoot them. I don't even like that question, John. <laughs> Well, just to debate the question, you and I, I think it's a frustrating question. Well, it's meant to be a frustrating question. There is a perception out there is that some people use um, that just war theory enables everything, including snipers sitting outside of abortion clinics, that the uh, fetus is undefended and we need to shoot people. Um, you know, for me, that is a twisting of the just war theory. Uh, just war has always been within the context of nations. There are huge tensions about abortion and Christians have latched onto abortion as the evil of our generation. If you're going to be vehemently against abortion, I think you have to be just as vehemently against the death penalty and just as vehemently against war. I don't think in any way, shape or form the individual that shoots an abortionist, that is in no way just war in my definition at all. Uh, that is, uh, that's a new Christian fundamentalism. Uh, that is a new zealot movement. And I think that that is incorrect. Um, 
I can disagree with the abortionist, and I certainly do. At the same time, I think that there can be other avenues and other productive means of dealing with this issue uh, rather than picking up a gun and shooting somebody who's an abortionist. I can't justify that. I think one of the problems is that Jesus' teaching has been neutered to, to really underwrite this passivism, this do nothing or be violent. It's plain to me at least that until the rule of God is fully manifest, what we call the eschaton, until the rule of God is fully manifest, there will always be a need for soldiering of some sort. This is not to, le to legitimate for a minute any kind of military rapacity or to give uh, any nation carte blanche with respect to military activity. But at the same time, I think that we are highly naive if we think that in a fallen world we can do without military presences. I think it's important to emphasize that Jesus spoke of peace not only as a goal to be obtained by any means necessary, to quote Malcolm X, but rather as a way of living, as demonstrated by Martin Luther King, on the other hand. Jesus spoke of peace as a lifestyle, not a goal. So you don't use violence, and you don't use other mechanisms in order to achieve peace. Peace is how you live. Following peace teaching gives you a whole list of questions, but I think they're the right questions we should be left with. The just war theory leaves us with an even bigger list of questions. The peace theory also leaves us with a list of questions, but they're the right questions we should be asking. You know, the question's asked, does love your enemy, is that a uh, contextualized command, depending on the circumstances? Um, if there's a greater good to be accomplished, is it okay to ignore that? You know, does it justify you know, negating Christ's commands. Again, you know, how you see that is going to determine a little bit your worldview. There are times where I think the evil that you are out to prevent is so great um, that, that it is responsible. That being said, I don't think the average person, even in today's 24-hour news channel day, who signs up to go to war, is going to be as completely sure on whether or not it was just or not. When you talk about debating, the church debating, uh, that's nothing new for anybody who spent any time in the church on anything, whether it's the color of carpets, mm -hmm. whether it's pianos, should drums be allowed in the sanctuary mm -hmm. of the Holy God. Mm -hmm. In not trying to be undiplomatic, Christianity's embrace of violence versus the pacifism taught by Jesus is not one of those issues. The church today as it exists is not the reflection of what the church was supposed to be. And I would submit that the church's embrace of violence and political power and nationalism is at the backbone of everything. Even the people who weren't Christians realize as they look at the church that George W. Bush saying, and this is neither pro nor negative Bush, but saying a, a, pres a Christian person saying, we're going to go to war and God says so, that portrays to the world an image of who Jesus is that is, and this is where I really get in trouble, is nothing short of heresy. I myself want to be a pacifist with all my heart. And I'm almost there until I see once again film footage of uh, five-year-old and eight-year-old and nine-year-old Jewish children huddled on a railway platform in Eastern Europe, three days away from their execution after they have been transported in virtually airless, waterless, toiletless freight cars for three days. When they arrived at such places as Theresienstadt and Auschwitz, whereas their parents were gassed first and then their bodies fed into crematoria, the children were fed live into crematoria. Now at this point I have to tell you my pacifism evaporates. I fail to understand how anybody could not intervene for the sake of those children, regardless of what that intervention entailed in situations like that. When they came with the SS troopers to round out the Jews in Sofia, the capital, they got the Jews down at the 
train station. They had them in a barbed wire enclosure. It was a rainy, misty night. Out of the darkness at 11 o'clock came Metropolitan Kirill, the leader of the Orthodox Church in Bulgaria. This seven foot four figure with a long flowing white beard hanging over his black robes emerges out of the fog. Can you imagine the drama of this? And then behind him come about 300 of the members of his congregation. They say his gait, his walk was so fast that the other men had to run just to keep up with him. He came to the entrance of the barbed wire enclosure. The SS guards pointed their machine guns at him and said, you can't go in there, father. He laughed at them, that's guts, brushed the machine guns aside and marched in among the Jews. They gathered around him, seeing what the Christian leader of Bulgaria would have to say in their moment of distress, in their moment of need. They were crying. Some of them were hysterical. They knew they were heading for Auschwitz unless something miraculous happened and something miraculous did. Metropolitan Kirill raised his arms, quoted one verse of scripture, and changed the destiny of the nation. Here's the verse. Quoting from the book of Ruth, he said to the Jews, hysterical, knowing they're about to be carted off to Auschwitz to die, whithersoever thou goest, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. The Jews cheered. The Christians who were outside the barbed wire exposure, they cheered. The noise was so great that people came out of their houses and started coming down increasing numbers to the train station. The hundreds grew to thousands. The SS troopers knew there was no way they were going to get away with rounding up these Jews and carrying them off to Auschwitz. The train left without the Jews and never returned again. And not a single Jew ever died in the concentration camp if he was a Bulgarian, because the Church of Jesus Christ boldly stood up and said, we're not going to kill the enemy. We are going to identify with the suffering and we will suffer with them. This is Jesus' way.